Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. An MSP trooper and a Livingston County Sheriff's deputy get into a shootout with a man near the old MSP post in Brighton. We'll have the details. Also new fallout tonight from President Trump's firing of FBI Director James Comey. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Those stories in just a moment, but we begin with breaking news in last night's deadly crash in Livingston County as the names of those killed and injured has just been released. Michigan State Police have finished the somber task of notifying family members of the five who died and the three who were injured. And that's why we're now able to show you the names. In the southbound vehicle, 20-year-old Justin Henderson and 24-year-old Preston Wetzel, they were killed. 22-year-old Matthew Carrier and 23-year-old Kyle Lixie were critically injured. In the eastbound vehicle, 35-year-old Candace Dunn, 69 year old Linda Hurley, and 73 year old Jerome Tortomasi were killed. 39 year old Albert Boswell is in critical condition. Let's bring in Rod Maloney now with more on how an evening of celebration turned so tragic for some of those involved. Rod? Yeah, Devin, you know, we're here at the probation office in Pontiac, and it's here that the people in the eastbound car have ties. You won't see a smiling face anyone anywhere here because Candace Dunn was an employee here who had won an award in Lansing last night, and it was a celebration of her. Today, they're in mourning of her. But there's so much to talk about this, and it starts with the 911 call that came in about 10.30 last night to the state police post. Um, somebody just blew straight through the stop sign and is fast. This car, I don't even know if they're alive. I'm going to go check it out right now. This desperately sad accident, five dead, three critically injured, capped off what had been a night of joy for four of the victims. 36-year-old Candace Dunn, State of Michigan probation agent and highly respected trainer, accepted the Agent of the Year Award last night at the Kellogg Center in Lansing. Most ironic is her thank you list. Lastly, I'd like to thank my family who is here with me tonight, my boyfriend Al and my dear friend and colleague Annie Breyer. I appreciate your unwavering support. And mom, I thank you for teaching me the value and working hard for what you believe in. They never made it home. Here is where it happened. The Dunn car coming eastbound on M59. The other car coming down Argentine Road in this direction. They hit right there where the spray paint is in the road. They scream over this way. One car winding up against the tree over here and another one winding up in the grass ditch over there. So beloved was Candace Dunn, the Department of Corrections brought in grief counselors to the Pontiac office today, along with the entire management staff. MDOC spokesperson Chris Gotts talks about how much Candace will be missed. Uh, everybody looked up to her, everybody loved her. She was a statewide trainer, so they're saying that statewide the impact is being felt here. Now, the cars, one of the cars burned. And we're told that they were cars in this accident. One may have been a Chrysler 300, but they were burned so badly and out of uh, recognition that we're not sure what they were. It's just cars at this point. There is so many questions that the state police are still trying to answer here. But at this point, we're going to have to wait for them to continue with that investigation to get more information on things like that. Back to you. Of course, Rod, one of the first things they look for is whether alcohol might have been involved in the accident. Any word on that? Well, you know, that's the thing. They're, they're, they're thinking about alcohol perhaps being involved, but they've never, they didn't get a chance to talk to the driver of the car that was coming southbound in Argentine, the 22-year-old from Fenton. He's in critical condition yeah. at U of M Hospital. He got transported there with the other two on the ground, brought into a surgery immediately, and they have not had a chance to talk to him or, or see any toxicology results to know whether that's involved or not at this yeah. point. All right, Rod, uh, well, I want to mention coming up on Local 4 News at 6, we examine the safety of the intersection where this terrible crash took place. M59 or Argentine will hear what people uh, and police who have to say about whether it might be a magnet for accidents. A Michigan State Trooper and a Livingston County Sheriff's Deputy traded gunfire with a suspect last night in Brighton Township. They shot the man several times and he's now in the hospital. Sean Lay is live with what we know about this shootout. Sean, good evening. We're finally getting some answers from Michigan State Police. Been asking all day. They're finally clearing things up just a few minutes ago, saying that they were called out to a man who had a gun. The man apparently would not put it down, so a trooper and a deputy decided to open fire. 
A Michigan State Police trooper and a Livingston County Sheriff's deputy were called to check on a man who was near this small white house along old US 23 near Spencer Road in Brighton Township. It just happens to sit next door to what was the former MSP post in Brighton, now a chiropractor's office. It was 1030 last night, and when the deputy and trooper arrived, Michigan State Police say shots were fired. We had a subject that uh, we encountered that there were shots fired. Uh, a trooper and a deputy uh, did shoot uh, during this uh, incident. What is clear is that the man was shot several times. The shooting taking place, we're told, in front of the chiropractor's office where one of those shots went into the office. And we're told the incident continued in the back of the building as well, where MSP was back today investigating. We have the Michigan State Police Second District uh, response investigative response team that have uh, taken over this investigation, and uh, they're located out of the Detroit area. So to be clear, this is a trooper and a sheriff's deputy in Livingston County opening fire on a man with a gun. That man apparently not firing shots back at them. The sheriff in Livingston County tells me that uh, both shootings here from the trooper and from the sheriff's deputy are under review. In his estimation, Kimberly, he thinks everything went well out there, went as planned, but this guy's in the hospital right now. All right, Sean. Shockwaves rumble in Washington after the sudden firing of FBI Director James Comey. The White House fiercely defending President Trump's decision, saying the commander in chief had been considering the move since his first day in office. But many Democrats say it's just a ploy to slow down the investigation into Russian election ties. Blaine Alexander has more from D.C. Blaine. And hello to you from the White House. The president had two meetings on the books today. The first with several Russian diplomats and the second with Henry Kissinger. He's the secretary of state under President Nixon. Now, the White House says that both of them had long been on the books. But today, for critics, they are certainly adding fuel to the fire. We want answers. We want answers. With outrage growing over the ouster of FBI Director James Comey, President Trump today defending his decision. Very simply, he was not doing a good job. The White House pointing to Comey's controversial handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. She would have fired Comey immediately, and the very Democrats that are criticizing the president today would be dancing in the streets. Perhaps more controversial, the timing as the FBI investigates possible ties between Russia and the Trump campaign. This amid conflicting reports that only days ago Comey requested more resources for that investigation. That has Democrats crying foul and demanding an independent prosecutor. There is a clear and present danger of a cover-up. It certainly appears that the president is trying to frustrate this investigation, trying to upend it. The White House insists Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein recommended Comey's firing. The president over the last several months lost confidence in Director Comey. The DOJ lost confidence in Director Comey. For President Trump today, an Oval Office meeting with Russia's top diplomat and Russia's U.S. ambassador at the center of the Russian investigation. No American media allowed inside. In a tweet of his own, the president lashing out at critics of Comey's termination, promising when things calm down, they will be thanking me. And the now ousted director has been invited to testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee next week. At the White House, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine, tomorrow night's NBC Nightly News is going to be appointment television. Lester Holt will sit down with President Trump for a wide-ranging one-on-one -on -one interview from the White House. Make sure you're here for that tomorrow night, 630 on Local 4. Indeed. All right, well, Ben picked a pretty nice day to be out of uh, the studio and mm -hmm. enjoying the weather. And he's geeking out is what he told he's us that today out. was all going to be about for weather <laughs> geeks like him. Hey, Ben. That's right. Uh, we're not just out, you know, killing time. We're actually doing some real work over here. We're at Southfield Public Library. It's weather fest and we'll talk more about that. But we did pick a good day. We had plenty of sunshine. Now the high clouds are starting to float in and eventually that's going to lead to rain, but not right now. Temperatures across the area are in the 60s, recovering nicely from our cool start this morning. In fact, we're at 64 at Metro, 65 in Ann Arbor. Just a little bit of a breeze out there. Coming up, we will be talking about the rain is coming tonight and looking forward, of course, to your Mother's Day weekend. 
But uh, out here, uh, some of the kids have got the Channel 4 Frisbees and are trying them out just to see how things are going. Also, the folks from the Southfield Fire Department are here. And coming up at 530, we'll actually go take a look at what's inside that trailer. It's a good interactive display, ways your kids can stay safe during severe weather. That and, of course, your seven-day forecast live from Southfield. Coming up, guys. Ben, you just caused pandemonium in the <laughs> studio. Everybody, we've got Frisbees? Where are the Frisbees? Where are the oh, Channel 4 Frisbees? frisbees? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can bring a few back. That please. would be good. Pop closet somewhere. All right, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. All right, in more news, police in Pontiac are looking for the gunman who shot and killed a man outside a parole office. The shooting happened today on Sitter Point Parkway. The victim was 38 years old and had just visited his parole officer. Police say the gunman is also a parolee. He's described as being about five. 8, 140 pounds, wearing a gray hoodie. If you have any information, call Pontiac Police. It's been more than a week since a Detroit police officer was shot, and tonight he is still fighting for his life. The officer was shot in the head the Sunday uh, before last on Detroit's west side. The suspect in the case was shot and killed by officers. According to Police Chief James Craig, the officer remains in a medically induced coma as doctors work to ease the swelling in his brain. Now another local 4 news update. We're getting our first look at the Detroit man charged in last week's shooting of a seven year old girl. This is a shooting that happened at a home on Monterey Street near Linwood and Davison. A seven year old girl asleep inside was hit in the neck. She has since now been released from the hospital. But now 23 year old Gervoni Martin is facing three counts of assault with intent to murder, one count of discharging uh, causing injury and a felony firearm charge as well. He's due back in court next month. Two more men have been arrested and charged in connection with the Greektown brawl. The fight was captured on video last month and posted to Facebook. Today, 24-year-old Tyron Larkins of Inkster was arraigned on charges for his alleged role. Last week, 21-year-old Rayshawn Yarborough, also of Inkster, was arraigned. So that brings the total to six suspects. All are facing three assault-related charges and an unarmed robbery charge and given $5 million bond. All right, still ahead, a shift in focus in the Chelsea Bruck murder trial today was all about the evidence. Plus, a mom who did time for murder is about to be fully vindicated. Why she's not only being cleared of a little boy's death, but also paid for all the time she's spent in prison. Jason? A father rushes outside to see his daughter being mauled by a dozen dogs. When I run out there, I start fighting dogs. Get them off my baby. That's all I could do. All right, man. If I had a gun, I'm not all of them. That little girl remains hospitalized here tonight. We'll update her condition. Tonight on New at 6. A family in southwest Detroit shaking in their shoes tonight. We have a little piece of video to show you why. A full-on police raid, and everyone inside had to get on the floor. Who are you? Why are you here? Why are you in my house? And they said, we're the police. We're the police. Why were police here? They say they were lied to. We've got the details. Also at 6, Macomb County Clerk Karen Spranger settles her dispute with the county, what she now has to do before a planned move to a new building. But first, an update to a story we first brought you as breaking news last night on the news at 11. The father of the five-year-old little girl mauled by a pack of dogs at a home on the east side says she is improving. A man who lives at that home is also in police custody for past violations regarding his dogs. Jason Colthorpe is live at St. John Hospital where that little girl remains in critical condition tonight. Jason. Uh, these dogs, as they're explained to me by uh, Detroit police, are no specific breed but uh, a mix, mix of dogs. And what they did is they did most of the damage to the little girl in her midsection. They also nipped her ear and bit her once on the head. Now her father talked to me a little while ago about those terrifying moments that happened just 10 minutes after they arrived at that house. If I were waiting another five seconds, my daughter could have been dead. Instead, five-year-old John A is alive and doing better today. She's doing all right. I mean, they ain't really doing much bad to it. I just took out some skin. They ain't hitting no organs or nothing like that. They got it real bad, though. Her father, who doesn't want to be identified, says they'd been to the home on Holcomb before, and John A had even played with some of the dogs. But this time, it was different as soon as she went outside. I just heard, Daddy, Daddy. Daddy. He says it looked like 15 dogs attacking his little girl. Man, it was just brutal to see your daughter just laying there 
Then her guts tore out by some dogs. He jumped in and fought the dogs off, even suffering some bites to his hand himself. Police tell me they took 12 dogs away from two properties owned by the same person. Police have 48-year-old Kenny Wiseman in custody for some outstanding traffic violations and a misdemeanor warrant for a prior incident of his dogs biting someone and for failing to turn those dogs in. No, I'm not angry. I'm not be angry about it. Maybe it wasn't his fault. I just think it's my fault because I should never took over there. Yeah, blaming himself a little bit on there. Uh, the family tells me this little girl is expected to be in the hospital for at least two weeks, but her father was very uh, optimistic about her being able to make pretty much a full recovery, and that's the good news tonight. Live at St. John Hospital, Jason Coulter, Local 4. So, and Jason, you say that this man is a family friend, the owner of the dogs, but does the father want him to be prosecuted for this? I asked him that, Kim, and he, he basically said he didn't want to answer, no mm -hmm. comment, but uh, as he told me the story, the owner of the dogs, he said, left for a moment, and then the incident happened, and then he returned, and he simply asked, what happened? He didn't say he was sorry or, or anything like that. However, I did talk to that man's brother today, and he said he's very shaken up by all of this. So, sure, but Kim. hopefully the little girl will be okay and pull through. Okay, Jason, thanks. Rescue crews were called to the scene of a construction site in Florida today to help save a crane operator. The worker was about 200 feet high off over the ground operating a crane this morning. This is near uh, downtown Tampa when he suffered some kind of medical issue. 911 was called. The man was then put onto a stretcher and lowered from the top of the crane. Not the usual rescue. Officials say Tampa's fire department has teams located in the downtown area, though, for just this type of emergency. Wow. Yeah. All right, Ben is. Uh, I was going to say playing hooky because he's just, we know he's out he's just having a lot of fun out today. There. He's got frisbees, I know, <laughs> standing outside and talking weather all day. I've been. I'm doing some work while I'm here, guys. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, we're not quite to average yet, but we're getting very close to that uh, with these afternoons that we've had. Uh, some of these temperatures outside have been downright delightful today. A lot of 60s, except on the east side, we've been seeing a couple 50s showing up with that uh, east and southeast wind. They're 58 in Monroe. Uh, right now, though, everybody else is in the 60s, slightly cooler downtown at 61, and you can see those numbers working towards 70 as you get towards the center part of the state. But here comes the rain. In fact, the high clouds in advance of this are already on their way, uh, sitting on top of us. Showers, though, right around the Chicagoland area and southern parts of Lake Michigan, just starting to push into southwest corners of the state. That'll be here overnight. So we'll get through the evening hours dry, and then after midnight tonight, look for showers to start developing. Tomorrow, we'll see a few scattered showers around. Not a ton of them, though. Still could see a rumble of thunder times, but mostly uh, we will be just looking for scattered showers on the day Thursday, and that's it for rain in the forecast that'll take us all the way through Mother's Day weekend. So tonight we're going to 47, and again, those showers developing after midnight. Winds will be on the light side out of the east, and then tomorrow, with the clouds and showers we're expecting, that is going to keep temperatures slightly cooler. So not quite to 60, but we will make up for it in that seven-day forecast, getting back to those numbers as we head towards Mother's Day weekend. And great news for folks to be running the race for the cure on Saturday. 66 in the afternoon, but uh, race starts with the mid and upper 40s, so very uh, conducive uh, to the folks that are going to be running out there this weekend. We're here in Southfield, and this is Weatherfest. Now, in addition to talking all about weather safety and a lot of science and stuff, you can also get a lot of free things. Alley's not for sale. You can't take Alley with you, but the folks from the National Weather Service are here. Our partners with Midland have a raffle where you can win a free weather radio. Folks from Southfield Public Library have all kinds of giveaways as well. And as we talked about earlier, Kim and Devin, the much coveted Channel 4 Frisbee is here. Bring so one back. Folks have been, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, we, we got a few. I just, I can't figure out how to fold this. Oh, thing yeah, right. Yeah, it's house, one of those so. newfangled things. Fancy. Yeah, Maybe one of the on interns that. can then, help me with yeah, that. The more you can fold it, the more likely you are to bring back three or four. So <laughs> there you go. We'll, we'll get it done. All right, Ben. We'll talk Thank to you in a few. All right, still ahead, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos encountering some pushback today while trying to deliver a college commencement speech. We'll show you what happened. Hi, Hank. Thousands could be left without power because of a big budget battle playing out in Washington. I'll show you how it could affect people here in Detroit. See you next
The Heat and Warmth Fund is a federally and state funded utility assistance program that helps thousands of families in Metro Detroit. With a new proposal, those families might not see that help in coming years. Our Help Me Hank tells us why and talks with a woman whose health will be on the line if that happens, Hank. And Kimberly Devin, this has a lot of people talking. Federal funding for Thaw has decreased during the last few years under the Obama administration, but they managed to keep things going. However, under the budget proposal under President Trump, the uh, images and the information we're getting on the table right now, things for Thaw could change dramatically. The folks who are helped by Thaw and this national program, LIHEAP, it could be any one of us. It could be our neighbors, our friends, our family members. It can be us. Thaw's CEO is worried that the program could be on the chopping block. Last year, Thaw received $140 million from the federal government another 50 million from the state. But right now, the president's new budget proposal would eliminate that federal funding. Supporters of that plan say the state should be able to cover the difference, but that would be an impossible challenge. We don't quite understand what low impact means. It impacts health. It impacts your ability to, to get and keep stable employment. It impacts education. It impacts stable housing and stable neighborhoods. What you may not know is they don't just deal with those who need heat in the winter months. Thaw also helps those who need the electricity to be kept on for their health. But we serve families uh, who are on medical devices. About 11% of the families we serve use a medical device 21 to 24 hours a day. People like Port Huron resident Bev Stroh, who suffered a collapsed lung from an on-the-job injury. It's a portable nebulizer, need electricity to plug it in. It's a breathing treatment that helps open up my bronchial airway. Without Thaw's help, Bev would be unable to run her nebulizer, putting her health at risk. Oh, tremendous support. Because I'm on a fixed income, I have a tight budget. Uh, so, yes, this is a political issue, but as we mentioned, President Barack Obama made cuts, and now President Trump is taking things up a notch. So what can you do? You can contact your representative, let them know what you think about the budget plan as it stands right now. Uh, Thaw, Devin, Kimberly, as you both know, helps so many people here in, in our state, more than 450,000. Yeah. Uh, so they're really hoping that the federal funding will stay intact. We've got a ways to go, though, before we see uh, what's in the final budget. Exactly. Yeah. Indeed. What are you working on for tomorrow, Hank? Uh, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. We're talking about gift cards. There's a new gift card scam that we need to make you aware of. One woman in Gross Point, in fact, losing almost $1,500 to this new scam. You'll hear her story and also hear how to protect yourself starting at 6 a.m. All right. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Hank. Sure. New at 5:30. Children get hurt all the time riding bikes, scooters, or skateboards. But there's one difference doctors see between the kids who need a band-aid and a hug and the ones who end up in the emergency room. Plus, if you ever made a donation to a furniture bank, you may decide to after seeing the powerful impact it can have. And the Chelsea Brook murder trial turns its focus to what investigators found in their search for her. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. Nearly two and a half years after Chelsea Brock disappeared from a Halloween party, forensic experts take center stage talking about what was found when her remains were discovered. And it tops our news at 530. You may recall Brock attended that Halloween party in Frenchtown Township, and then her body was discovered in Ash Township six months later at a construction site. And tonight, forensic experts say DNA from the man accused of killing her was found on her body. Our Mara McDonald joins us now live in the newsroom in Mara Brock's costume held a lot of focus in court today. It sure did. The costume she painstakingly put together for the party, it was presented in court. Let's take a look. Chelsea was excited to go to this Halloween party and spent weeks making her poison ivy outfit. The outfit that was still very much intact when it was found, except for two glaring spots, the crotch of the costume and one of the straps, experts testified. The rips in the fabric were not consistent with someone who took it off, rather with someone tearing at it with keys to get it off. This is the picture of the leotard that I received. Daniel Clay's DNA was found on the costume and the wig Bruck was wearing. She was found when John Marcon was hauling dirt on the property he owns in Ash Township. He's the one who found her skeletal remains. I was looking at the dirt pile, and I was, I was actually looking to see if I could get the dozer back in there because it was kind of a tight area. 
And then I looked off to my left and that's when I noticed a body. Back here alive, realized that Brooks' body was found on Marcon's property, but the costume was discovered at an industrial site. Forensic pathologists say a blow to the head is what killed her. We are live in the newsroom. I'm Mara McDonald, Local 4. All right, Mara. Shining a laser at an airplane, airplane rather, is no longer just a federal crime here in Michigan. It's now a violation of state law, too. That's after Governor Snyder signed a new law on Tuesday. The legislation makes shining a laser pointer at an aircraft or a moving train, we should note, a felony. A light from the lasers can, of course, temporarily blind pilots and we would point out conductors. Those caught committing the crime could face up to five years in prison along with a $10,000 fine. Contention at a Florida commencement. Bethune-Cookman University students stood turning their backs on their commencement speaker, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. Thank, Thank you, you so, so very, very, very much for this great honor and privilege. And it's a real honor and privilege to be with you as we celebrate. Students at the historically black college had protested the choice of speaker for days, but the school's president was unmoved. Secretary DeVos has been criticized for saying that historically black colleges are, quote, real pioneers when it comes to school choice. The schools were started because African Americans were not allowed to attend white schools. Mystery shrouds the death of a Norton Shores police officer. It was a single car crash that happened around 445 this morning while that officer was on duty. When emergency crews arrived on the scene, Officer John Ginka was severely injured, was taken to the hospital, but that's where he later died from those injuries. The 10 year veteran leaves behind a wife and two children. It is not yet known at this hour what led up to the crash. The wife of longtime ESPN broadcaster Chris Berman has died. 67 year old Catherine Berman was one of two people killed in a car wreck Tuesday afternoon in Woodbury, Connecticut. According to the police report, Berman rear ended another vehicle, veered off the road and then landed upside down in a small uh, pool of water. In a statement, ESPN called the death a devastating tragedy and difficult to comprehend. The Bermans have been married for 33 years. They have two children. The car crash remains under investigation. A Texas woman gets a second chance after serving time for a murder. A prosecutor will declare Hannah Overton innocent in the death of a four-year-old child. Andrew Byrd died in 2006 from high levels of sodium in his body. Prosecutors said Overton force-fed Andrew a mixture of spicy seasoning and water. Defense lawyers argued Andrew's death was accidental, the result of a rare medical condition. Overton was convicted of capital murder in 2007. In 2014, the state's highest criminal court overturned her conviction and sent her case back to the county. Then, in 2015, the then district attorney dropped the case against her but refused to declare her innocent. Today's action entitles Overton to state funds and protects her from being retried. Good health today. New statistics out show dozens of kids are taken to the ER every hour, dozens every hour after getting hurt on a bike, a scooter or a skateboard. Dr. McGeorge is here with the one thing many of the kids aren't doing that really could help protect them. He joins us now. Well, Karen and Devin, you know, I have seen it over and over again. Kids enjoying a day of cycling or zipping around on a scooter and then they have an accident and a trip to the ER becomes a part of their day. The thing that separates the kids that go home quickly from the ones that are seriously injured is often a simple helmet. A neighborhood sidewalk seems like a perfectly safe place for a girl to ride her scooter, with one caveat. Concrete is concrete no matter where it is. A fall here is just as dangerous as a fall on a busy road, making helmets crucial. Safe Kids Worldwide surveyed 1,600 parents with kids between the age of 5 and 14. Nearly 40% said they don't always require their kids to wear a helmet when skating or riding bikes, scooters, or skateboards. And it's not a matter of, you know, if kids are going to fall, it's when they're going to fall. We want to make sure that when they do fall, they have protective gear on. The potential for injury is real. Safe Kids Worldwide says that in 2015, nearly 50 children an hour went to an emergency department after getting hurt on a skateboard, bike, or scooter. Some were head injuries, most were broken bones. Protective gear we recommend are knee pads, uh, elbow pads, wrist pads. Experts say parents can be good role models. In fact, 86% of moms and dads who wore helmets had kids who also adhered to the helmet rule. Now, more recently, scooters in particular have been a rising problem. And now, in general, parents should help kids wear helmets properly by making sure they don't wiggle around on the head and make sure that the chin strap is secure. Back to you.
All right, thank you, Doc. Spring cleaning season brings an opportunity to help mm. Metro Detroit families with things most of us take for granted. Essentials like couches or beds, uh, tables, they're often out of reach for some people transitioning from homelessness. But the st sense of stability and the dignity that they can bring into a home is kind of tough to overstate, isn't it? Photojournalist Alex Atwell shows us the impact you can make through the furniture bank. What kind of a start does a child have in life if they're sleeping on a floor? What kind of a family life do you have if you have to live on a floor? We take furniture for granted, but it is a vitally important component of a successful family life. At first I was wondering how I would use the living room with no furniture to sit on. Today we're delivering furniture to the home of Deborah, and she is one of 1,500 families that the Furniture Bank is going to help this year. Can you just sit in the kitchen for me? Please and thank you. I'm very grateful. I'm able to have people over now and not be embarrassed that we all have to sit on the floor or that we all stand. I'm real grateful that people do donate. Thank you. Go from sitting on that wooden chair in this living room to a couch, what is that going to mean? Oh, comfort. <laughs> Tell me what happened as soon as they brought the furniture in. What did he do? Once the couch was set up, he crawled over to stand up on it to see, well, where, where did that come from? I'm happy. Really comfortable, stress-free. The more furniture that's donated to us, the more families like Deborah's were able to help. Yeah, you happy? Are you happy? Great look at it, Alex. It really is. It's about dignity. It it's really is. Really great. And for more information on how to donate, we should point out your gently used furniture uh, or even have the furniture bank come pick it up. Check out the story on the community page of clickondetroit.com. That little baby was very, was very sweet. happy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, still ahead, obviously, she wasn't expecting a tip. This waitress arrested after pulling a knife on a family inside a restaurant. What set her off? Also, a convicted killer's jailbreak fails miserably, and this picture uh, that you're seeing here only tells part of what went wrong. We'll have more in just a minute. Steve? We continue our focus on our failing Michigan roads. Yeah, potholes are a big problem, but this is a bigger problem. Long stretches of roadway that are crumbling, crackling. Why can't we get better roads? Mr. Room. New at six. It was a court battle that never made it into the courtroom. However, a judge has ruled in Macomb County versus the clerk, Karen Springer. As we reported, several people killed in a horrific crash here along M59 in Livingston County. But I'm Nick Monticelli. There are bigger questions now. Is this intersection too dangerous? All right, Nick. Well, we continue now our focus on Michigan's failing roads that rank among the worst in the country. Comes as no surprise that less than 20% of the state's roads, less than 20% are in so-called good condition. So this kind of opens up the debate because everybody always has a reason on why the roads are in such bad shape. Maybe too many trucks, harsh winters, or something more basic. Steve Gargiola joins us now live in Southfield with some of those answers. Hi, Steve. Hey, Kimberly and Devin. We all agree, a big pothole, big, huge problem, cause a lot of damage to your car. But the problem with our Michigan roads really more far reaching. This is the problem. It's not about avoiding a pothole. It's about long stretches of roadway that are cracking, crumbling, gouges, ruts. They're just falling apart. And of course, potholes. Why don't our bad roads get any better? It doesn't take a scientific study to determine the condition of Michigan roads. You just have to drive. I think a lot has to do with the the up and down weather here in Michigan, but the roads are absolutely horrible. I think the roads here are terrible. They're really bad, and they do a lot of damage to our cars. Why are Michigan roads so bad? Many critics point to heavy trucks as the source of our problems. Federal law requires that every state allow trucks up to 80,000 pounds on the interstates. But in Michigan... We do allow twice the weight of every other state's trucks in Michigan. Our state allows this to reduce shipping costs, encouraging companies to do more business in Michigan. But does it ruin our roads? The answer is 
Probably not. Without getting too technical here, the typical 80,000 pound truck rides on five axles. For those extra heavy tandem trucks, Michigan requires 11 axles to better distribute the weight. Engineers will tell you that it's the weight per axle that's more important than the gross weight. So one giant sized double truck actually puts less stress on the roads than two regular sized rigs. So maybe the problem is our weather. We do have snow and ice in the winter and that's hard on roads. But so do countries in Europe. Germany, for example, has beautiful roads and they have harsh winters like us. So what's the difference that makes German roads great and our roads, well, less than great? The biggest problem we've had in Michigan over the years is that we just haven't adequately funded our road system. It often comes down to money. In January, the Michigan tax on unleaded gas increased for the first time in 20 years, from 19 cents to 26.3 cents per gallon. So Michigan's total gas tax, federal and state combined, is about 45 cents a gallon. In Germany, the gas tax is $2.10 a gallon. Germans pay on average $5.70 for a gallon of gas, largely because of the heavy tax. In Iceland, a gallon of gas costs $7.20. Would you pay $7 a gallon to have really great roads? No, I wouldn't, but Ohio has better roads than us and they got a toll system. That would change like a $30 like charge to like about 60, 70 just to fill up one time. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money, I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. The bottom line is, sometimes you get what you pay for. Yeah, I'm with those folks. I don't think any of us want to think about $7 a gallon to get rid of that and make our roads smooth. But you know, there are a lot of lawmakers in Michigan that think money is not the issue. Just last week, there was an amendment considered in the state Senate that would have put $542 million of uncommitted budget dollars toward fixing the roads. But Senate Republicans voted it down, saying they believe that money could be better spent elsewhere. Reporting live in Southfield, I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4. Comes it, down to the money. It does, of course, but the sad thing is what Steve is, Steve, what you're standing to next to right there, I wish that we could say that that was just sort of atypical, but that's what the roads look like all over the place. Well, it, and, and now we're in Southfield, and I don't want to put the blame on Southfield because the roads, this is obviously bad. Yeah. But it's true. It's all across the state. It is an issue all across the state of Michigan. And whether or not money is the answer, I don't know. That appears to be the, the debate in the, in the state yeah. Senate. Yeah. All right, Steve. Uh, we'll point out again, if you see a pothole, let us know. Head to our Facebook page on clickondetroit.com slash potholes. Local 4 News, today's uh, Pothole Patrol. It's highlighting the rough roads to avoid on your ride to work because taking the wrong way can be very expensive.